Chapter 40, The Resurrection of Christ The disciples rested on the Sabbath, sorrowing for the death of their Lord, while Jesus, the King of glory, lay in the tomb. As night drew on, soldiers were stationed to guard the Savior's resting place, while angels, unseen, hovered above the sacred spot. The night wore slowly away, and while it was yet dark, the watching angels knew that the time for the release of God's dear Son, their loved commander, had nearly come. As they were waiting with the deepest emotion the hour of his triumph, a mighty angel came flying swiftly from heaven. His face was like the lightning, and his garments white as snow. His light dispersed the darkness from his track, and caused the evil angels who had triumphantly claimed the body of Jesus to flee in terror from his brightness and glory. One of the angelic hosts who had witnessed the scene of Christ's humiliation and was watching his resting place, joined the angel from heaven, and together they came down to the sepulcher. The earth trembled and shook as they approached, and there was a great earthquake. Terror seized the Roman guard. Where was now their power to keep the body of Jesus? They did not think of their duty, or of the disciples stealing him away. As the light of the angels shone around, brighter than the sun, that Roman guard fell as dead men to the ground. One of the angels laid hold of the great stone and rolled it away from the door of the sepulchre and seated himself upon it. The other entered the tomb and unbound the napkin from the head of Jesus. Then the angel from heaven, with a voice that caused the earth to quake, cried out, Thou Son of God, thy Father calls thee. Come forth. Death could hold dominion over him no longer. Jesus arose from the dead, a triumphant conqueror. In solemn awe, the angelic host gazed upon the scene. And as Jesus came forth from the sepulchre, those shining angels prostrated themselves to the earth in worship and hailed him with songs of victory and triumph. Satan's angels had been compelled to flee before the bright, penetrating light of the heavenly angels, and they bitterly complained to their king that their prey had been violently taken from them, and that he whom they so much hated had risen from the dead. Satan and his hosts had exalted that their power over fallen man had caused the Lord of life to be laid in the grave, but short was their hellish triumph. For as Jesus walked forth from his prison house, a majestic conqueror, Satan knew that after a season he must die, and his kingdom pass unto him whose right it was. He lamented and raged that notwithstanding all his efforts, Jesus had not been overcome, but had opened a way of salvation for man, and whosoever would might walk in it and be saved. The evil angels and their commander met in council to consider how they could still work against the government of God. Satan bade his servants go to the chief priests and elders. Said he, We succeeded in deceiving them, blinding their eyes and hardening their hearts against Jesus. We made them believe that he was an impostor. That Roman guard will carry the hateful news that Christ has risen. We led the priests and elders on to hate Jesus and to murder him. Now hold it before them that if it becomes known that Jesus is risen, they will be stoned by the people for putting to death an innocent man. As the host of heavenly angels departed from the sepulchre and the light and glory passed away, the Roman guard ventured to raise their heads and look about them. They were filled with amazement as they saw that the great stone had been rolled from the door of the sepulchre and that the body of Jesus was gone. They hastened to the city to make known to the priests and elders what they had seen. As those murderers listened to the marvelous report, paleness sat upon every face. Horror seized them at the thought of what they had done. If the report was correct, they were lost. For a time they sat in silence, looking upon one another's faces, not knowing what to do or what to say. To accept the report would be to condemn themselves. They went aside to consult as to what should be done. They reasoned that if the report brought by the guard should be circulated among the people, those who put Christ to death would be slain as his murderers. It was decided to hire the soldiers to keep the matter secret. The priests and elders offered them a large sum of money, saying, 
Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And when the guard inquired what would be done with them for sleeping at their post, the Jewish officers promised to persuade the governor and secure their safety. For the sake of money, the Roman guard sold their honor and agreed to follow the counsel of the priests and elders. When Jesus, as he hung upon the cross, cried out, It is finished. The rocks rent, the earth shook, and some of the graves were opened. When he arose a victor over death and the grave, while the earth was reeling and the glory of heaven shone around the sacred spot, many of the righteous dead, obedient to his call, came forth as witnesses that he had risen. Those favored risen saints came forth glorified. They were chosen and holy ones of every age, from creation down even to the days of Christ. Thus, while the Jewish leaders were seeking to conceal the fact of Christ's resurrection, God chose to bring up a company from their graves to testify that Jesus had risen and to declare his glory. Those risen ones differed in stature and form, some being more noble in appearance than others. I was informed that the inhabitants of earth had been degenerating, losing their strength and comeliness. Satan has the power of disease and death, and with every age the effects of the curse have been more visible and the power of Satan more plainly seen. Those who lived in the days of Noah and Abraham resembled the angels in form, comeliness, and strength. But every succeeding generation has been growing weaker and more subject to disease, and their life has been of shorter duration. Satan has been learning how to annoy and enfeeble the race. Those who came forth after the resurrection of Jesus appeared to many, telling them that the sacrifice for man was completed, that Jesus, whom the Jews crucified, had risen from the dead, and in proof of their words they declared, We be risen with him. They bore testimony that it was by his mighty power that they had been called forth from their graves. Notwithstanding the lying reports circulated, the resurrection of Christ could not be concealed by Satan, his angels, or the chief priests. For this holy company brought forth from their graves spread the wonderful, joyful news. Also, Jesus showed himself to his sorrowing, heartbroken disciples, dispelling their fears and causing them joy and gladness. As the news spread from city to city and from town to town, the Jews in their turn feared for their lives and concealed the hatred which they cherished toward the disciples. Their only hope was to spread their lying report, and those who wished this lie to be true accepted it. Pilate trembled as he heard that Christ had risen. He could not doubt the testimony given, and from that hour peace left him forever. For the sake of worldly honor, for fear of losing his authority and his life, he had delivered Jesus to die. He was now fully convinced that it was not merely an innocent man of whose blood he was guilty, but the Son of God. Miserable to its close was the life of Pilate. Despair and anguish crushed every hopeful, joyful feeling. He refused to be comforted and died a most miserable death. Here's a footnote about Herod. It was Herod Antipas who took part in the trial of Christ, and Herod Agrippa I who put James to death. Agrippa was nephew and brother-in-law of Antipas. Through intrigue, he secured the throne of Antipas for himself, and on coming to power pursued the same course toward the Christians that Antipas had followed. In the Herodian dynasty, there were six persons who bore the name of Herod. It thus served in a measure as a general title, the individuals being designated by other names as Antipas, Philip, Agrippa, etc., so we might say, Tsar Nicholas, Tsar Alexander, etc. In the present instance, this use of the term becomes more natural and appropriate, inasmuch as Agrippa, when he put James to death, occupied the throne of Antipas, who a little before had been concerned in the trial of Christ. And he manifested the same character. It was the same Herodian spirit, only in another personality. 
as the dragon of Revelation 12.17 is the same as the dragon of verse 3, the real inspiring power in each being the dragon of verse 9. In the one case he works through pagan Rome, in the other through our own government. Herod's heart had grown still harder, and when he heard that Christ had risen, he was not much troubled. He took the life of James, and when he saw that this pleased the Jews, he took Peter also, intending to put him to death. But God had a work for Peter to do, and sent his angel to deliver him. Herod was visited with the judgments of God. While exalting himself in the presence of a great multitude, he was smitten by the angel of the Lord and died a most horrible death. Early in the morning of the first day of the week, before it was yet light, holy women came to the sepulcher, bringing sweet spices to anoint the body of Jesus. They found that the heavy stone had been rolled away from the door of the sepulcher, and the body of Jesus was not there. Their hearts sunk within them, and they feared that their enemies had taken away the body. Suddenly they beheld two angels in white apparel, their faces bright and shining. These heavenly beings understood the errand of the women, and immediately told them that Jesus was not there. He had risen, but they could behold the place where he had lain. They bade them go and tell his disciples that he would go before them into Galilee. With fear and great joy, the women hurried back to the sorrowing disciples and told them the things which they had seen and heard. The disciples could not believe that Christ had risen, but, with the women who had brought the report, ran hastily to the sepulcher. They found that Jesus was not there. They saw his linen clothes, but could not believe the good news that he had risen from the dead. They returned home, marveling at what they had seen, also at the report brought them by the women. But Mary chose to linger around the sepulchre, thinking of what she had seen, and distressed with the thought that she might have been deceived. She felt that new trials awaited her. Her grief was renewed, and she broke forth in bitter weeping. She stooped down to look again into the sepulchre, and beheld two angels clothed in white. One was sitting where the head of Jesus had lain, the other where his feet had been. They spoke to her tenderly, and asked her why she wept. She replied, They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. As she turned from the sepulchre, she saw Jesus standing near, but knew him not. He spoke to her tenderly, inquiring the cause of her sorrow, and asking whom she was seeking. Supposing that he was the gardener, she begged him, if he had borne away her Lord, to tell her where he had laid him that she might take him away. Jesus spoke to her with his own heavenly voice, saying, Mary. She was acquainted with the tones of that dear voice, and quickly answered, Master, and in her joy was about to embrace him. But Jesus said, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Joyfully she hastened to the disciples with the good news. Jesus quickly ascended to his Father to hear from his lips that he accepted the sacrifice, and to receive all power in heaven and upon earth. Angels like a cloud surrounded the Son of God, and bade the everlasting gates be lifted up, that the King of glory might come in. I saw that while Jesus was with that bright heavenly host in the presence of God, and surrounded by his glory, he did not forget his disciples upon the earth, but received power from his Father that he might return and impart power to them. The same day he returned and showed himself to his disciples. He suffered them then to touch him, for he had ascended to his Father and had received power. At this time Thomas was not present. He would not humbly receive the report of the disciples, but firmly and self-confidently affirmed that he would not believe unless he should put his fingers in the prints of the nails and his hand in the side where the cruel spear was thrust. In this he showed a lack of confidence in his brethren. If all should require the same evidence, none would now receive Jesus and believe in his resurrection. But it was the will of God that the report of the disciples should be received by those who could not themselves see and hear the risen Savior. 
God was not pleased with the unbelief of Thomas. When Jesus again met with his disciples, Thomas was with them, and when he beheld Jesus, he believed. But he had declared that he would not be satisfied without the evidence of feeling added to sight, and Jesus gave him the evidence which he had desired. Thomas cried out, My Lord and my God. But Jesus reproved him for his unbelief, saying, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. In like manner, those who have had no experience in the first and second angel's messages must receive them from others who had an experience, and followed down through the messages. As Jesus was rejected, so I saw that these messages have been rejected. And as the disciples declared that there is salvation in no other name under heaven given among men, so also should the servants of God faithfully and fearlessly warn those who embrace but a part of the truths connected with the third message, that they must gladly receive all the messages as God has given them, or have no part in the matter. While the holy women were carrying the report that Jesus had risen, the Roman guard were circulating the lie that had been put into their mouths by the chief priests and elders that the disciples came by night while they slept and stole the body of Jesus. Satan had put this lie into the hearts and mouths of the chief priests, and the people stood ready to receive their word. But God had made this matter sure, and placed this important event upon which our salvation depends beyond all doubt, and it was impossible for priests and elders to cover it up. Witnesses were raised from the dead to testify to Christ's resurrection. Jesus remained with his disciples forty days, causing them joy and gladness of heart as he opened to them more fully the realities of the kingdom of God. He commissioned them to bear testimony to the things which they had seen and heard concerning his sufferings, death, and resurrection, that he had made a sacrifice for sin, and that all who would might come unto him and find life. With faithful tenderness he told them that they would be persecuted and distressed, but they would find relief in recalling their experience and remembering the words which he had spoken to them. He told them that he had overcome the temptations of Satan and obtained the victory through trials and suffering. Satan could have no more power over him, but would bring his temptations to bear more directly upon them and upon all who should believe in his name. But they could overcome as he had overcome. Jesus endowed his disciples with power to work miracles, and told them that although they should be persecuted by wicked men, he would from time to time send his angels to deliver them. Their lives could not be taken until their mission should be accomplished. Then they might be required to seal with their blood the testimonies which they had borne. His anxious followers gladly listened to his teachings, eagerly feasting upon every word which fell from his holy lips. Now they certainly knew that he was the Savior of the world. His words sunk deep into their hearts, and they sorrowed that they must soon be parted from their heavenly teacher, and no longer hear comforting, gracious words from his lips. But again their hearts were warmed with love and exceeding joy, as Jesus told them that he would go and prepare mansions for them, and come again, and receive them, that they might be ever with him. He promised also to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to guide them into all truth. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them.